Well, hello everyone. Today I have a great real estate investor and a mentor of mine and an author of the book, Wake Up and Smell the Real Estate, Tom McKay from Austin, Texas. The guy knows more about real estate than almost anyone I've ever met. So Tom, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to talk to you about real estate investing. Uh, thanks, Manny. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Absolutely, man. Yeah. So yeah, the real estate uh, you know, I stumbled into it when I was 19 years old and it was just kind of by chance. I'd already been interested in real estate and I'd looked at some books and read things about it, but it was really kind of, just kind of fell into my hands from the very beginning. And I just kind of learned real early uh, at 19 uh, that I could buy a property. I bought my first property when I was 19 years old. I bought a 6,000 square foot commercial building. And uh, uh, shortly after I purchased it, uh, uh, I was offered twenty thousand dollars more than I paid for. Well, we, we, you know, we got to start talking about that. I want to get into the detail. You know, I <laughs> I like the nuts and bolts of all of these things. And uh, it's unfortunate the last interview we recorded, which was almost two hours long, where we went into the nuts and bolts of everything. Did. Unfortunately, <laughs> I did not record it. Yeah. So here we are doing this again, and uh, I'm gonna assume I'm gonna go back to the same level of. Like, I'm going to try and ask the most basic questions to get to how this all worked out for you. So let's, let's, let's rewind all the way. Uh, and bef actually, before I do that, I want to set the stage for our audience here, just so they understand what, like, just to, uh, just to understand you a little bit. So Tom, I have personally been to Austin. I've spent time with you. I've actually tra literally gone to the properties with you. Yeah. I've met your tenants. I have literally like we've gone into multiple properties as we've done this. So I know there's a lot of real estate education out there. There's a lot of people who are teaching education, teaching real estate. And I'm always like, it's not always clear who is the real deal in the world of real estate financing or real estate investing. And I can say that, like, I know that because I've been around you now enough and I've seen all of your properties, like literally been inside those properties and talked to your tenants to know that everything you're talking about is as real as it gets. So guys pay attention just, you know, just because of that, like Tom is legit hundred percent. Um, what he's talking about is exactly as it is. And um, I think the book is a really small portion of what's inside Tom's brain. So I'm going to try and pick, pick more of that in this interview. So Tom, uh, with that said, um, let's start with your story and let's take people back to when you were 19 around that time, right? You had finished high school. You didn't even go to college. Tell us the story. What was going on? What was your story with your parents or your family? And what, what were the dynamics like at the time? Sure. Sure. Well, I, I my folks worked in aircraft. My dad did. My mom did like computer program, which is very like key part, key, what is it, key card punching back then. And uh, anyways, but so they were subject to layoffs and then they got a divorce and I ended up living with my dad, but we'd been on welfare at times and we got the free cheese and the macaroni and powdered milk and you know, so I, I got a pretty good taste of poverty <laughs> for the most part when I was a kid, as much as poverty is in the USA. I mean, we ate and, uh, you know, hand me down clothes. And, uh, and uh, so I got a taste of the cruelty of kids picking on the poor kids, being one of them. And, uh, you know, kids not going, you know, other kids going to camp, that camp was where other kids went, you know, and things like that. But um, so I had, was incentivized to not be poor. I just didn't want to be poor. And uh, I was pretty entrepreneurial early on, selling candy and that sort of thing. But um, ultimately, uh, as I, you know, grew up, I was in high school and uh, I was anxious to get out of high school because I wanted to make money. And so I took a GED, I dropped out of high school. I took a test and I dropped out and I found out six months later or something that, that I'd passed, but I got up pretty young. So when I was 17, I went to work in a cabinet shop. And uh, before I went to the cabinet shop, I, I got a taste of really hard work. I, my job was, you know, throw rocks in the front bucket of a, of a, a tractor as we picked up, you know, demo, demo material. And I, I knew very quickly that's not what I wanted to do for a living. 
but I made money. It was probably making five bucks an hour back then. And then uh, uh, I got a call from the cabinet shop and they said, hey, you know, we like you. I went to work for there. And in about a year and a half time, I kind of learned most of the trade. I mean, I was pretty competent cabinet maker, not completely, you can't learn that quick, but, but enough that when my boss went out of business, I started up in my garage. And uh, I started working out of the back of a duplex in a garage. And then uh, I outgrew my garage and then I had to rent a building and then I rented a building. And this hang is on, back no, hang on. This is when you were still 19, 18, 19, 20 years old. Oh, uh, no, probably more like 17. This is 17. 17. So you're, yeah. you haven't even gotten out of high school yet. You're, uh, you're my st- friends were still in high school. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my friends were still in high school. But and you had stepped out, you had already like left high school to, to pursue this. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, well, and the guy that I worked for, uh, he, uh, he had some issues. He, you know, was going through a divorce and had some other issues. And it was tough times. Interest rate was about 15% back then. And, uh, you know, there was odd and even gas days and the economy was not doing well. And so he went under and I, I went to work out of my garage and started to grow a little bit, got rented a building, then times were tough and I moved into the building that I rented. I was like sleeping in an office within the building. Uh, landlord found out and said, Tom, you can't, can't live in the building. You're, he goes, you're gonna, if the place burns down, I'll get sued and <laughs> you'll die. And uh, so I started looking again. And uh, so I reached out to a property I saw in the, in the newspaper and that hooked me up with an agent. Uh, I think his name was Robert Dennis. And he took me around and we started looking at stuff that was for rent. And then we pull up to this building. He goes, well, how'd you like to buy this? And I looked at it and I thought, huh, that's funny. I said, I used to work in this building. And it was the building my boss and he'd been, uh, he'd been foreclosed on. And so I said, well, how am I going to buy it? I didn't have any money. Let me tell you, I wasn't living in my office because I had money. So at this point, me... you are 19, 18, right. 19, is that what it is? 19, and the real estate yeah. agent is supposedly taking you out to show you properties to rent. And he's right. saying, hey, why don't you just buy this building? And you were thinking, this guy's crazy. Right. Well, I told well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, I had long hair down on my shoulders. I had bloodshot eyes because I had, was allergic to everything. So I kind of looked like, I, people would think I was high when they first saw me until they got to talking to me. And then they realized, oh, this guy's okay. But, uh, but he said, hey, Tom, they'll never even see you. He goes, let's just make an offer. And he said, what can you do? I said, well, I don't have any money. And I go, I really can just go in and probably, you know, rent the place. And he, he's the one, you know, he wanted to make a commission. So he was incentivized to, to make things work. And so he's the one who introduced me to owner financing. And he says, well, look, they can carry the note. And I said, okay, well, what's that exactly? He says, well, they'll, they'll finance it. You come up with a down payment. And so what we decided is, is I said, well, I could probably get 10 grand together in six months. And uh, I said, but can I move into the building? Okay, so how much was the property that was the... Like it was being offered for at the time. Uh, I'm going to, I don't remember exactly, but I'm going to say it was 120, might've been 110,000, something okay. like that. And so uh, uh, he said, okay, well, let's start with that. And so, and the owner wanted 10 K down for you to be able to buy the building. Yeah. Well, the owner just wanted to sell it. The owner was out of town, which is also mm-hmm. another thing is when you get somebody out of town, they feel less secure. They want to get things going. Moving quicker. And so, I put the fear in them when I made the offer. Uh, I said, basically, I made an offer uh, uh, six months escrow, and I could move into the building and stay in the building. Uh, I mean, I could move into the building, meaning my company could move into the building. And So this was a commercial building? Uh, commercial building. It was basically a, like a little stucco 2,000-square-foot uh, building with a 4,000-square-foot metal building stuck on the back. And okay. it was perfect for a cabinet shop. It was really perfect. And so uh, we made the offer, six-month escrow with uh, a buyer has the right to occupy the property. And so I basically moved in, lived in the building. And uh, at the end of six months, I, you know, I just saved everything that I didn't have to pay in rent. And I had my 10 grand down. I probably put 500 down, down so I had another 9,500. And so I bought the property. So, okay. So just to, just to clarify for the listeners here, um, when you agreed on this owner financing deal, the owner said, well, put some earnest money down to know, to, for me to know that you're interested. And then 
the the time that you were in the property, he gave you six months to close the escrow. For the six months, he didn't even ask you for rent. He was no, just like, I, well, yeah, I conditioned it on that. I said, I'll, I'll take the property, but I want six months to be able to occupy a prior. But it, t- things were tough. And I put the worry, I said, I'll make sure nobody vandalizes the place. Mm-hmm. So I kind of put that fear in their mind already, you know. And uh, so they thought, well, yeah, we don't want the place getting vandalized. So I put $500 down. Uh, non-refundable. So they now I had some skin in the game, not much, but they could see that. Mm-hmm. And so at the end of six months, I had to come up with the other 9,500, which I did. And the, basically there was five trust deeds, uh, or five notes secured by this thing. Uh, and they just wrapped all five and created what we call an all-inclusive trustee. And what uh, basically they'll call it a wraparound. They have a different terminology for it. Can't even really do it today because uh, it triggers an triggers an on sale or do on sale clause. But anyways, uh, I got the property. And <clears throat> so, you know, 19, got this big old building. Uh, now the payments were coming in $1,100 a month. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that I needed to pay. And that was on. Uh, but, so it was $1,100 a month because you were doing an interest only payment at the time? Like what yeah. was the deal like? Yeah, yeah, I think it was actually interest only. It was 10% interest on probably $110,000. And you had made the $10,000 down payment, $110,000. Uh, 10% interest would make $11,000 a year. So around $1,000 a month is what you're paying. Yeah, as I remember, it was $1,100 a month. But, $1,100 you know, a month. Long time. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you're paying interest only at the time. Probably you're paying insurance and all of that, tax and all that stuff. So it's 1100 something like that. And... Uh, How's that like when someone's thinking, when, when someone's new and they're thinking, well, owner financing, I'm like a, an average investor is thinking, well, or average uh, person who has never financed or never gone through this process is thinking, well, how is that different from going through a bank and getting that financing? Uh, what was like, sounds like it was a breeze for you compared to getting a finance from getting our traditional financing. So can you differentiate that a little bit? Sure. And everybody should really clue in on this because it's a world of difference. I mean, the difference is with owner financing, there's no qualifying. It's just up to the owner and there is no credit check. And there's a lot of benefits to owner financing, but one of them is, is that uh, the owner is going to make as much interest as a bank would if they were going to sell it to you. So that's his incentive for, for financing for you if he feels good about you and he feels good about the collateral, which is the property. So that's huge. Uh, But the other thing is, is that the difference is a bank would never have loaned me that money. I was 19 years old. I had no job history. I had had no job. You had no credit history. I mean, you had a job, but you don't have job history. You don't have credit history. You don't have money in the bank. You don't have a down payment. Everything is against you at this point. Yeah. Well, I mean, technically I would have had a down payment because I saved 10 grand, but, but I didn't, there's no way where they're going to loan a 19 year old kid a hundred grand. That's just not going to happen. And, you know, and what was my job? I mean, I worked a year and a half for a cabinet shop that went out of business. So that, that, that was it. But th- that's the best thing you need to come away with. This is anybody can buy anything. When it comes to owner financing, there are no rules. The rules are whatever you can create and get the owner to agree with. And that's what happened in that case. Well, not long after I bought that, the for sale sign was still in the front of the building. I was standing out in front of the building and a guy pulled up and he says, hey, how much they want for that building? And I said, well, it's not for sale. I said, I bought it. And he said, what'd you pay for it? And I told him I think 110. And he says, well, sh- I'll give you 20,000 more right now. And so I was like, wow. You know, it just dawned on me that I made $20,000 or I had the opportunity right there, assuming he was serious. And I think he was because that lit a fire under me. Uh, in fact, my passion was about building cabinets prior to that day, okay? Because prior to that day, I just spent six months saving 10 grand. And now this guy just offered me 20 grand for one day's work. I just closed the deal, right? Mm-hmm. So I thought, wow, there's some money in this. And so, uh, I, you know, I wasn't interested in selling. I was interested in building my cabinet shop at the time. But man, I immediately started I just didn't, I didn't stop looking and I started looking for more and more owner finance deals. And, um, you know, I found a house not long after that 
it was an owner finance, but uh, again, it was one that I I, uh, I I I made up cards that said I buy properties under fifty thousand dollars. So how did you come up with that? Like at that point, you didn't really have fifty thousand dollars saved up, did you? So no, for but- you to say. I buy a property under $50,000. What was going on in your mind at the time? Well, number one was going on in my mind is that I could talk them into owner financing, <laughs> mm-hmm. but that's not always possible because there's a mortgage. So a lot of times, you know, and they, people do it with data mining and stuff. They look for properties that have been owned for 30 years because there's a higher likelihood that the property's paid off. So uh, anyways, uh, that, that first deal, uh, you know, that one was the one that got me, you know, kicked up and excited. Then I started looking for other properties and uh, I found this house. Uh, somebody called me off that sign, told the agent, I said, I'll take it. I'm on my way. Uh, and I met the people on the house and their dad was in there and they wanted to get him out. It was kind of a mess. And so we all went over to the house together. And I mean, it was a mess. There were like mm-hmm. rhinos on the couch and there were, uh, you know, it was just a, gross stinky mess you walked in the door the the baseboards were white at the bottom turned to kind of a brown to a dark brown at the top uh and how much was the house asking uh, price it, it, uh, the house is worth about 60 70 thousand the way i figured it and they just this guy called me the agent dan mcmahon uh he uh they used to call him the gentleman realtor i think is what he called himself but they, they used to like to give themselves little catchphrases like that anyways he, he called me off the card and we all went over there together, walked in there. Parents were just disgusted seeing their dad sitting on the couch with these two strangers, looked like drug addicts. We walked around through the kitchen. The kitchen was disgusting. There's cockroaches dead in grease and pans on, you know, just a mess. The stove was pulled out, walked around the corner into the hallway. And I said, is there, how's the air conditioner? And they said, well, we don't know. So this is kind of funny because it was me, the agent, the wife and husband, uh, and I go to pull on this door and it's like tough and I grab both hands and I yank on it really hard. And we got showered in cockroaches. <laughs> and the woman just screamed. And when we looked inside, you could, I mean, the walls were moving. They were covered with cockroaches inside there. It was really disgusting. And uh, she said, let's just get out of here. And so we went out of there, we went to his office and I said, look, that itself probably um, lowered the price of the pro- property by another oh. 10 to 20 percent that little thing oh yeah yeah it was a game changer right there <laughs> she was done and i don't even know whose father it was but they were both done and she so i said look i can give you fifty thousand dollars if you own or finance it with five thousand dollars down or i can give you thirty four thousand dollars cash in one month they said we'll take the thirty four thousand dollars cash we wrote it up i did not have the cash and so, but I had the deal and that's what I emphasize to anybody. The main thing is, is getting a deal and you can look at properties that are far beyond your reach of what you can afford. But if you know value, then if, as long as you can get a deal put together where you have the rights to buy it substantially under market, that's your margin. That's your margin that you got to play with. And so <clears throat> I bought that one with a buddy of mine named Dan. He was a successful guy and uh, he came up with the money. We bought it. And we sold it uh, and uh, we split the profit on that. I think we each got $8,000 out of it or something like that. So you went to your buddy, Dan, and said, hey, I got this deal. Uh, I could buy this for 30, 34000 I know if you rehab it and do all the work, it will sell for much more. Let's go in on the deal together. Yeah. So that's why, yeah. So I made him my partner. He, he came up with the money. I think he financed it on credit cards, to be honest. And we bought that thing. And then uh, we, uh, you know, we sold it and then I found another one. So you didn't put any money in that deal? No. So it no. was his money, your deal finding, and you guys split the profits. Right, right. Absolutely. And so like, you know, people call me and they'll say, hey, Tom, is it too much to spend 10% on a hard money loan, meaning somebody will loan them the money to buy a deal? And I say, listen, I don't care if it's 15%. If you don't have good credit, if you don't have the cash, if you have a great deal, that's not too much to pay because the alternative to paying 10% interest on the property or on the loan to buy the property is make them a partner and give them half your profit. And mm-hmm. if you're buying it right, 15% of your, you know, is nothing, is nothing. Or it should be nothing if you buy it right. You got to buy it under market. If you're not buying, mm-hmm. 
it under market, then don't buy it. It's just not, it doesn't make any sense. So, so that led to, you know, several more houses in the neighborhood I looked for. And, and now I had my own cash besides I had my building. And then, uh, you know, I found another one, an FHA loan. I assumed the loan, which you could do back then. And, uh, I, uh, so you assume the loan from someone who already was in a mortgage at the time? Yeah, they used to have FHA loans and they, they didn't have a do on sale clause. And if you don't know what that is, it just means that when they sell the property, they, the, the, they have to pay off the note. Well, mm -hmm. Back then, if it didn't have a do on sale clause or an alienation clause, as it's referred to, you could assume the note. And that's the other great thing about owner financing. When you, when you buy a property and you get the owner financing put in place, if you guys don't put an alienation clause in there, <coughs> excuse me, then it doesn't exist. So that allows you to sell the property and let somebody assume that loan that you created. You know, I bought a restaurant. I think I showed you this when you were up here. But one of my, one of my tenants said, hey, Tom, the restaurant next door just came available. I was there in like a minute looked at the, the sign, called the agent, made a deal that evening, and I bought this property for $750,000, 50000 down, and that 700000 I got him to carry it at 3% interest, which is a fantastic deal. And uh, so I had like a $2,100 a month payment on a $700,000 loan, which is almost unheard of. So the way that served So again, me, this was an interest-only loan. That you had assumed it was almost interest only or you know or either way it was going to have a due on sale i think i had it where it was all due and payable in, in 10 years anyways or maybe it was fully financed i can't remember but the interest rate was so low it was just amazing and that's why i say i don't i tell people don't worry about if you agree to buy something as long as you have five years to pay it off even though you might need 30 don't worry about it because hey you're buying it under market Somebody else will take you out of it if you, they can assume that note. But in five years, you can refi it or you can sell it and make money on it anyway. So, uh, so I don't sweat. When I buy something, I don't go, gee, they, you know, they want to be paid off in less than 30 years. Well, I'm not going to hold it for 30 years. I'm probably going to hold it for 30 So days. five years later, so let's take the case of this person who buys the property and they didn't really have any credit score or didn't have any like income uh, that was good enough income for the last few years. And now they bought the property. They have hold, held on to the property. They've been make, making the payments to the seller for the last three years or four years. Yeah. Could they actually refinance with a, with a bank in those situations? Because the bank sure. would probably still be looking for some sort of uh, like, um, hey, what's your income? What's your like, can you actually cover the mortgage payment on something like this and so on and so forth, right? Well, I mean, if they've destroyed their credit, the bank's not going to loan them any money, for sure not. But at least they're in a position where they can just sell it to somebody that does have good credit. And, mm -hmm. you know, they'll do what they do. But again, for me, if you can put the financing in place, but when you buy it with owner financing, that's a huge advantage, like when you go to sell it. Because now somebody that doesn't have good credit can take your loan. And you can charge them more for it because they need it. They need it. And so that's also a possibility. And there's plenty of people that have a decent down payment, but they have terrible credit. So they're mm -hmm. stuck. Mm -hmm. And so those are the people that owner finance is probably most important to. And, you know, I, I had a deal. This is interesting. I had an apartment deal. And I'm going to mess up the numbers a little bit. But I bought a property. I think it was a 24-unit apartment building. And I got it owner financed. Again, 3% loan. Well, when I sold it five years later, I got an all cash offer on it. And so we made a deal all cash, but at the escrow table, the day we were about to close, I told them, I said, hey, I see you got a loan going in place. And I go, how about if I give you a loan for 300,000 at 3%? And I go, but I'm gonna charge you 30 grand. And they said, that sounds good to us. Hold and on, so, you're going to charge them 30 grand as a down payment? Third, no, no. So what it is, is they're about to buy, pay, pay a property for me cash. One that I have an owner carried note on. That's mm -hmm. a really cheap, cheap rate. Sure. 
And so what I told them is at the table, and they had the cash together. They were getting the finances. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So you're becoming the intermediary to the deal. You're just handing over your own and financing to someone else. Right, but I didn't tell them that. I went uh -huh. to the table saying, they're going to cash me out. Mm -hmm. And now after the deal's done, we already made a deal. I'm saying, look, I can give you a note for 300000 at 3%, but I'm going to charge you another $30,000 on the deal. Mm -hmm. And this is like in the last 10 minutes before we're supposed to close. Mm -hmm. And so they go, wow. And I said, look, do the math on it. Because I just kind of occurred to me on the spot. And so they go, you know what? That's a fantastic. They're going to save 50 grand overall. So what we did is we raised the price $30,000. And they gave me, basically, they gave me $30,000 and they assumed my note. So now if I sold it for 500, now I'm selling it for 530,000. So if you get those notes, that's how all these banks make their money anyways, on points and things and putting it together. You can kind of be the banker uh, or at least the uh, facilitator, you know? Um, but, yeah, you're eliminating the bank and that's why you're able to create such a arbitrage in terms of interest rates. Correct. Or such, yeah. uh, you know, such low interest rates for yourself. Right, and, uh, and so along with that, um, uh, like I said, it, it opens up what you can do. I mean, you can buy, and, uh, and right now, in the way things are today with interest rates so low, uh, you know, people used to be able to put a hundred grand in the bank and make ten thousand dollars a year on. Well, now they make one thousand dollars a year on hundred grand. And people that are of retirement age, they can't live on that. And maybe they don't know about real estate, or they don't, you know, they don't, and they're scared of stocks. Which, like the coronavirus, everything's taken a you know, huge dives. So everybody's paranoid about stocks. A lot of people are. And so <coughs> the owner finance is, sorry, is great because you can get somebody to, to own or carry, give them 5% on their money rather than, and it's attractive to them because they're going to get five times what they get if they just put it in savings. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's uh, fast forward this journey. Well, not even, I don't want to fast forward the journey. We're talking the time when you were owner financing. Now you're 20, 21, 22. You already bought and sold multiple properties at this time. Take us to that time. Where are you? And I, I believe you were somewhere in California at the time. Yep. And uh, how was life and what were your next moves in terms of real estate investing? Uh, well, primarily what I did was... Uh, I just first I kept looking at houses, then I started going to commercial buildings. And in fact, this is another thing, uh, assignments, a lot of money in assigning deals and people call them flips or whatever. It's not really a flip. It's kind of a pre-flip deal. And what I'm talking about is, uh, and again, this is all learned by experience. There is a building across the street and down from the building that I'd owned and operated. And I found out that this plumbing outfit had gone out of business. Well, the building was cool. I'm looking at it. It's empty. Nobody's there. I'm thinking, I want to buy this. I want to make something happen. Well, I found out where the people were that owned the building and that were in foreclosure. And I said, hey, look, let's not let this go to foreclosure. They said, well, you know, we don't even care anymore. And I said, well, look, can I have the rights to buy it? And so I made an agreement with them to buy it from them where they deeded it in my name. But the, the people that were holding the note, they were, this had owner financing too, but they didn't want to finance it for me. They said, no, we just want to get cashed out or we're going to foreclose. So, but I got the rights. I got the contract going, pre-foreclosure. And I reached out to my old boss, John Brooks. And I said, hey, John, I got this great deal. I think I can get it for, you know, 170. And I think it's worth 220 or maybe it was 120 worth 220. And he said, okay, I'll come look. And so he came over and we walked through it. And he looks at me and says, hey, Tommy. He, he said, man, this is a good deal. And I said, well, let's buy it. And we'll sell it. We'll split the money. And he says, well, I don't want a partner. And I was kind of confused by it. Well, what are you saying? You know, what are you saying? Yeah. And he said, look, he goes, how about I just buy it myself and I'll give you $20,000. And of course, I'm probably 20 years old. I'm like, that's a great idea, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> excuse me. So that was my introduction to assignments. And that's what I did is I basically created a document and said, I'm assigning him my position in this property, the contract, for twenty thousand dollars. And he took my position, gave me twenty grand. And you know, and John, I'll tell you what, that guy, he actually died not too long ago, 
and he was a hell of a nice guy. Uh, really, really well loved by builders, and I was a contractor with myself. But when he died, I'll bet he was worth about a hundred million dollars. Yeah, and he was uh, sixty years old. That was more than 10, 15 years ago, I think, when he wow. died. And uh, he just, just you know, he, you know, kept, he was uh, a he was a real estate investor. He was a just the same real estate investor. He made money in business in his in his. Uh, he built erected steel buildings and did different things. And, uh, but he parlayed it into industrial property on hundreds of thousands of square feet, you know, maybe a million square feet. And, uh, but maybe more than, maybe a couple million square feet. Anyways, but that guy also made a ton of money in real estate. And, uh, you know, there's just so many people that do. And anybody can do it. And a lot of people don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. Anybody can do it. Because the, 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 there's nothing that anybody has an advantage over. People may have cash on hand, and that's an advantage to buy. But getting a deal is a whole different ball game. Getting a deal is about finding a deal and having the rights to buy it. And as long as you do that, I don't care how poor you are, as long as you have that, you're in the position to make money. So how do you do that? How do you get a deal? How do you find a deal? I know that's a topic all by itself. You could probably yeah. talk about it for hours. Yeah. But let's say tomorrow, I say, Tom, come to San Diego. Let's go find a deal. I and, can find one. <laughs> and people would one. say here, oh, you're crazy, Manny. There's no deals to be found in San Diego right now. It's a crazy market. The market has just gone through the roof. Uh, and you're saying, uh, well, what are we going to do? No, no, yeah. I mean... You got to just keep your eyes open, but you can dig and look. And, you know, I'm somebody that when I'm driving down the street and I see a sign laying down on its side and you can't read it, I turn around and I prop that sign up or I look at it. I'm not necessarily prop it up for other people to see. I look at it and I go, oh, this is for sale. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do things that nobody else will do. If I see a garage sale, I go to the garage sale, not for the crap in the garage. I go there because I want to know if a house is for sale. Is the owner moving? Is a tenant moving out? What's the story on this house? And that's an opportunity to make money because when a vacancy in the house means an opportunity to sell. But no, so I have a thing I call uh, real estate barbell, okay? And everywhere I've ever lived, it's ended up happening. And so to give you an example. So like if I got my house here, what mm -hmm. ends up happening, and then let's say I work, here, here's my factory. Okay. Um, uh, what I end up doing is, is because you're saying, where do I look? I look everywhere that's convenient. So what's convenient is looking around my house. Mm -hmm. And when I go to work, looking at what's at work. And so what I, it's, I go back and look, you know, even from a topo view, uh, what I find out is I end up buying properties all around my house mm -hmm. and I buy properties all around my building, my place of business. Mm -hmm. And then I end up buying stuff in between. Mm -hmm. And so this is a real Can you estate. raise it a little bit just for yeah. people to see? So, yeah. so in other words, I buy everything up around my house that's convenient, I find. And then I buy up things around my, my building, my place of work. And then I buy up in between. And that's that handle between the yep. two weights, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I've literally seen you do this in the sense driving with you. I've seen you so many times. You just, uh, you just relentlessly, every time you see a sign, you're taking a picture of the phone number or calling them right then and there, talking to them, trying to figure out what's going on. So this is what you're saying is actually what I have seen you do multiple times. Yes. Now, the question in my mind is like how you, I guess partly you are, savvy real estate investor at this time, you've seen it all, you know the market in and out, and you probably know a deal, you can smell the deal from, from a bit away, right? So yeah. how does a new person get started on like finding a deal? What is the process here? Well, the number one thing is you gotta know value. And so, like I say, the easiest thing for you to do is look around where you are the most. So if you're at home, look around your neighborhood. If you're at work, look around your work and look at everything in between, but look around your home because just think about when you go to buy a car, you take your time, you look at, see what 
the car you want is, and then you decide, okay, how much are they? And then you shop around. And then when you all of a sudden find a good deal, you know, this is a great deal. After everything else you've looked at, that's a great deal. So you buy it. Well, why stop there? You just got all this knowledge about what value is on that particular model. Keep looking for that same model. And I apply mm -hmm. that to real estate. I look at real estate and I'm looking for houses, a good deal on a house. Well, I see everything selling at market. When I see something that's selling for 30, 40% under market per foot or however you want to look at it, I say, I'll take it. And I go put a deposit down and I worry about paying for it later. And so you, you put a deposit down and you worry about paying it later because the, what's the, what's the thinking behind that? The, 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 like, tell, tell us about that. Like what, someone who's listening to this is saying, Oh, Tom, of course, he's got millions of dollars worth of property. He doesn't care. He can of course figure out a way to finance this. But someone who's starting, what are they going to like, how are they going to say, well, I will figure out financing. The thing that stops the people is the thing you're saying can always be figured out or that's the easy part. So tell us about that. Well, what, what I'm looking at is I'm looking for a profit. I'm looking for a profit right now. So, when I find a prof a property, it has to be worth more than I'm willing to pay for it. So or, or it has to be worth more than what anybody's willing to pay for it. So when I find the property, I sign, I get the deal. Now, all I really care about is having enough time to either pay for it myself. If I have cash, that's great. Or, you know, I have a lot of money now, but I mean, so I can pay cash for a lot of stuff usually. And but if it's beyond my means, then I need time to get the cash together or find a buyer that I can assign the property to. So, so there are quite a few things you're saying here. Let's say a property is worth a million dollars. What is a good earnest deposit? What is a good earnest timeline on something like that? Well, I mean, I think on average people will accept 60 days in a real hot market. Days. I mean, if you watch my videos on my, you know, my YouTube channel, Flip Anything USA, you'll see I buy properties in three days, seven days, 10 days, because I do it to blow everybody out and, you know, and take it. But a lot of times in general, if you're typically going to buy something that's going to be financed, you know, it's reasonable to say, I want, you know, 45 day look, 60 day close, meaning you okay. have time to investigate the property, but you'll close it in 60 days. And what percent of the property are you putting down as a deposit? What percent Ooh. price? Like, let's say if it's a million dollar property, how much would you put down as a deposit? That's uh, earnest. I, I would, uh, 20, 25%, as little as possible. No, no, 25% of a million, $250,000 is a deposit? Oh, deposit, I'm sorry. Uh, no, well, it, let me put it this way. If I was, if it was me, 20, 30 years ago, I would probably say $1,000 and hope that they would take that. For a million dollar property, you're putting down $1,000. Yeah, but I might say, if they say that's a little bit light, then I might say, well, you know what? I'm just gonna give you 1,000 now and I'll give you $10,000 more at the end of the contingency period. So in other words, I'll up it in 10 days after I see the title report. I'll make up an excuse, you know, to buy a little time. <coughs> And then I'll be worried about finding that 10 grand or I'll be just worrying about finding somebody else that has the 10 grand. So at that point, when you're putting the money down, you're already establishing a price. You're saying, I will buy this property. I know. Okay. So there's a mil there's a property that you know could put is on, is being offered to you for 1.2. You negotiate a deal. You say, no, I will pay a million. And they're like, well, and you're like, I'll pay a million. Here's my thousand dollars and give me 10 days to do my initial due diligence. And then I will pay you another 10 K just for, just to like, if they are saying, Hey, that's I've a, done that a lot of times. And I do, right. and I make other people do it too. I sold the property a while back for 2.8 million and I let them put $20,000 down. I said, it's mm -hmm. non-refundable after 10 days. And I said, and then that's fine. I said, you can close it in 30 days with 20,000 down. That's fine. They put $20,000 down and then when we got close to the 10 days, they said, hey, uh, we need a little bit more time. I said, okay, we'll just make the 20,000 non-refundable and now I'll give you 15 more days to close. So now I gave them 45 days. And so 
at the end of the 45 days, they said, hey, we need a little bit. I said, well, give me $50,000 down more, non-refundable, and I'll give you 15 more days. And they do it. And, you know, it happens. <clears throat> or they're going to back out and lose. And how much down. was the property worth? $2.8 million. That oh, okay. Yeah. So they put 1% down, then they put another 1% down. Yeah. Kind I of mean, 1% of the property price in some ways. Right. But, but I can tell you now where I'm at now, like when I buy a house, because I just want to blow everybody out, I put a $10,000 deposit on a $200,000 home, on a $250,000 home. It's just, here's 10,000. I'm going to close it in 15 days. That's normally, because I'm going to pay cash for it now. And people are motivated with somebody that can close quickly. So mm -hmm. it's, and, and, and the thing is, is don't concentrate on trying to get so much time. I realize it's, it's difficult to do, especially if you don't have money. But if you really have a great deal, you can find somebody like me that has money in your town, go to that person, your old boss, like I did with John Brooks, or your buddy, like my buddy, Dan, who was successful for being, had a good job, and you'll find it. I mean, if there is... 20, 30% of a million dollars or, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever it is, it's all relative. Somebody will make it happen so they can realize that profit. And so the main thing is, is no, no value. And then, and I, I've got a lot of details in my book of just about how I do. And, you know, just by riding around with me, keeping your eyes open and, and, you know, knocking on a door or seeing blinds that are messed up. You know, when you see blinds that are torn up, that's a good sign that somebody, either the landlord's not going to be happy with that tenant or the person that lives there is not happy with themselves. Something's wrong. So, uh, you know, distressed properties are, are, are definitely a sign to stop and, and look deeper. Right. So you have certain signals you'd look for when you're looking for uh, what you call value in the marketplace, right? You're figuring out, okay, this property definitely is going to be sold soon or for a price below what I would like to acquire. Uh, I want to buy, I think I can buy this property for less than what I can potentially sell it for down the line. It's because of certain conditions that you are seeing what you call quote unquote value. Uh, like you're looking for value. It's really, you were finding even before you see, like you step in that place, you already, you're, there's a radar, like you already have certain indicators that tell you, oh yeah, this kind of property is probably the kind I'm looking at, or I, I think yeah, this would it's make just, sense. It's not intuition. It's more like a knowledge base. It's a repetition. It's just, you, you, you start to get an idea. I mean, I know like, you know, it's, it's weird. I probably would not be successful in Michigan where houses are $30,000 because the house costs more than 30,000 to build. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other thing, you know, I see people buying all these houses for 10, 20, 30,000. The problem with buying those is you can't buy a fixer upper for 10, 20, 30,000, because if, if the house is, you know, let's say you get a good deal, $10,000 and houses are worth 30 in that area. Well, you can't hardly, if you got to fix it up, it's hard not to spend 10, 20 grand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Depending on how bad it is, you know, it's just kitchens are expensive and all that stuff. It's expensive. Um, so uh, land too. Land is a fantastic way to make money. Look at land. And that offers the number one source of probably uh, owner financing extends to land because mm -hmm. the banks don't touch land. So owners are forced to owner finance in general. Um, so. <clears throat> Tell, I mean, I know land is something, as you say, it's mostly owner finance. The banks are not touching it. But at the same time, someone who's, thinking of getting in real estate, they are just as scared or even more scared than a bank to touch your, touch something like that because there's no cash flow with land most of the times. So you're hoping to find another deal or someone who's gonna um, take you, who's gonna be able to buy it at higher price than what you bought it for. So how, what's, what's, what's it like for you to go and buy land? Well, you gotta remember, just because land may look unattractive to you, but it has a value. It has a purpose to somebody else. There's buyers for everything. Every, I mean, I've been in, uh, God, what's, what's the, the terrible, uh, Compton. I've been in Compton 
looking at property, okay? Rough, rough, horrible area. I never, well, I think it's better today than it was when I was there 30 years ago. I wouldn't touch it, mm -hmm. but there's buyers there. There's people buying up the deals there. They do. Property still changes hands. So yeah. everything has value to somebody else. And with land, what I concentrated on with land was I would look for buildable lots where people could build a home. And I know that as soon as I get a great deal on a lot, I can go to a builder and say, hey, I have a property. And what's great about a builder is he's going to go to the bank. The bank's going to insist that he pay cash for the property before they loan money on, you know, loan them a construction loan. So they will pay off the loan because they want to be in the first position. They don't want to uh, be subordinate to a first. So that's what happens. The, you'll get cashed out quickly on land. And, you know, there's just incredible deals on land. I bought 70 acres one time. Let's talk about that. Like, tell us a story of uh, land acquisition and how you played it. And yeah. would you, would you like, there's a part of me uh, or there's the question maybe for someone who's learning to invest at this stage is, is that a speculative investment? If, especially when you don't have enough money to invest in land compared to, let's say, uh, would you rather just invest in property where you could be cash flowing? No, I don't think anybody should be a speculator until they're already rich. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, I'll give you an example and I'll get back to your deal, but like I just signed a lease, uh, made a deal last night, signed a deal today. And it's a tenant of mine. They're going to take a little more space. They're going to extend. And that lease is worth $25,000 a month. So they're going to pay me $300,000 a year. And that's for renting a building, one building that I have. And that, that property is for cash flow. Okay. If, if, and that property is paid for, I mean, I own that one outright, but that kind of deal, uh, you can, you can buy a building. Uh, I mean, if you buy to hold, you're taking a chance that the values can go down. Just look at the, you know, right now, stocks, people bought stocks last week and they're dreading it today. You know, they speculated. That's what I don't like about speculation. I'm not a, a speculator. I buy property knowing what it's worth. It's worth more than I'm paying for it today. Therefore, I can sell it immediately and realize a profit. And that is the safest way to do it. Once you have millions or, you know, wherever your limit is in there that makes you happy, then maybe you go buy a house that's a rental or buy a, you know, a duplex or a fourplex or apartment buildings. I bought, you know, I bought many apartment buildings. I bought commercial buildings, industrial buildings. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing. People think they're, they're afraid of these different types of price. It doesn't matter. There's somebody that needs a place to build. There's somebody that needs a place to have a school. I have a Montessori mm -hmm. schools rent for me. I have jujitsu schools. I have all kinds of schools. Dance schools rent from me. You got to realize, you got to realize that you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I was, got on some blog the other day and that's kind of correcting this guy's thinking from bigger pockets. And I was like, no, it, what he was talking about was buying something. He was talking about a really slow way to get rich. Which was what? Buy a house and rent it out and it'll be paid for in 20 years or something. Or like 30 that. years, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Right. And, and, and what people don't realize and why you shouldn't start that way is I've seen uh, like uh, uh, people go buy their first home and they get all excited because in the first phase of this track, you know, they're $110,000. Then the second phase, you know, six, eight months later, now they're 130. Well, I made $20,000. That's great. Then the third phase, three years later, third phase is now they're 165,000. Oh, they're so excited. They're making money. Then all of a sudden, devastation of some sort, you know, like right now, oil plummeted the other day. So places that are real near oil, values are going to go down for sure. Okay. So these people, all of a sudden, the third phase will sell them for 165. All of a sudden, the, the developers say, hey, you know what? We got to cut our prices back to what the first phase was. So they can do that, but nobody else can. So as soon as they go into that third phase and they cut things back down to 110,000, 
everybody screwed before then. Third phase people that started buying, they paid more. They're, they're stuck. Second phase people paid more. They're stuck. First phase people, they can sell it. They can compete, but they've got a used home. They've got a brand new home, so they can't compete. So speculation will get you in a lot of trouble. If you can't afford to hold, if you can't afford a downturn, then don't do it. And, you know, I have a great chapter in here, too, on, in, in my book called uh, leapfrogging. Leapfrogging is a term I coined, and basically it's something that I do. When, if I'm in a position where I'm bidding on a property with other people, what I do is I try to isolate the seller, and I say, look, I'll give you X, and I jump way over everybody else. Give you an example. I have property, they were, they were taking offers. And they said, well, we've already got an offer for So it was an auction or they were just taking They were doing it auction style. It really mm -hmm. wasn't a true auction. They were saying, uh, we're taking offers. And so today, and the agent was there that day. And they'd already had two people offer 110, 120. I go, look, I go, I'm leaving town, which wasn't true. I said, I'm leaving town. I want to kill this thing right now. I'll give you $150,000. No, I'll give you $160,000 but I want a sign deal by known by right now and pull the sign out of the front yard and let's be done. Because I knew by five o'clock at the end of that day, these two guys that are going back 110, 120 and building up slowly like this every hour, they're gonna hit 200,000 by the end of the day. And by the end of the day, when people get off work and they're driving home and they see the property for sale, the phones are gonna light up because that's when it, most deals happen after 5 p.m. People get off work. The agent mm -hmm. says, hey, I got a great house. One just came on the market. It just came on the MLS. They mm -hmm. can't look till 5 p.m. So you got to act quickly. And, and, and back to my thing, what I call leapfrogging, is when you're in that sort of position, you just jump ahead and say, look, I'll give you substantially more than these guys will. Still under market. But you say, I got to have a deal right now. We got to sign it. And that, you know, they went to the owner and the owner said, hey, I, I, you know, a deal in the hand is worth two in the bush. And so he accepted my offer. And by 1 p.m., I had it signed and I was buying it for 160. By 3, 4 p.m. that day, they had multiple backup offers that were substantially more than what I just bought it for or what I had the rights to buy it for. Hmm. Okay. Now, leapfrogging, because we were talking about the other scenario where when, va when values start to drop, and if you're the guy that bought one of these track homes in the first, second, or third phase, when things start to drop, realize it's not gonna get better. They're gonna keep getting worse. You're on a downward trend. So you leapfrog the other way. If you went out of your property, you go, I'm selling it. And you, instead of you know, lowering it $5,000 more than the guy, you lower it 20,000 more than your competition. So that it's gonna be the first choice. It's gonna get bought. And you're gonna get the last little bit of money that's in town available for that type of purchasing. And you'll, and you'll get rid of your property. And it'll mm -hmm. go down below what you even sold it for. But you will have, leapfrogged everyone else and, and beat it out hmm. and <coughs> so to to go back to the idea of building wealth slowly versus fast what uh, most people on bigger pockets and uh, a lot of the other real estate investment advice is buy and hold which is buy a property for cash flow get the cash flow maybe buy a property which will return one percent of its value in rent every month and you will probably get an eight cap on that and you hold on to that property and every year you buy one property and every year you buy one property and over time you will build wealth. And you were saying that's not really the way to go. So what's your philosophy on wealth building, on fast wealth building in real estate? It, well, I mean, if you wanna work your whole life and you want to retire mm -hmm. when you're 60 and on a very small amount, but you wanna have, I mean, <laughs> the, sl the slow way to riches would be if you have a good job, buy a house. Even if you get a, you know, get a good deal on it, sit on it. Then when you got that thing cash flowing and, and now you saved another 10 grand from your job, go buy another house. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then go buy another. And some people can do this, but you're getting rich very, very slowly. Yeah. If you concentrate on a purchase and make yourself 10 grand that day. Now you got 10 grand in the bank. Then you do it again. Then you do it again. And now by the end of the year, 
you have enough money to pay cash for a house. So we're talking in some ways, finding deals, flipping deals, flipping houses is what we're talking about. Instead, mm -hmm. it's not really very active flipping where you're trying to go and do all the uh, construction or reconstruction, or all of those things. You're yeah. actually yeah. finding the deal and then reassigning the deal in some ways, or either taking over the deal yourself to sell it very quickly or to reassign to someone else. Right, right. I mean, if you want to get rich safely mm -hmm. and, and quickly, mm -hmm. then what you need to do is only buy a bargain. Only mm -hmm. buy a bargain. You know, Warren Buffett, you know, he's the same way. He, he, he'll see thousands of things pitched at him, but mm -hmm. he only swings at the thing that's a great deal. Right. And that's how you got to be. And it takes patience. Mm -hmm. And it takes hard work. You got to dig and dig and dig and dig, but the deals are out there. Somebody's always dying. Somebody's always getting a divorce. Somebody's making a, a terrible mistake and bad decisions. And there's opportunities in every town, everywhere, every day, everywhere in the world. Somebody's making a mistake or they're fed up, they're done. They're going to sell under market. And those aren't put right in your face. They don't fall <coughs> in your lap necessarily. But those deals do exist and you just have to look for them and you need to know how to look for them. And then, uh, but, but no matter whether you're want to be a long-term person or real safe, or you don't have any time, you know, like I know some doctors and they don't have much time. They work mm -hmm. all the time, but mm -hmm. they have a hell of an income. You know, they make a hundred grand a month, you know, mm -hmm. so they can go buy a million dollar property and they can eat a $30,000 loss sometimes on some months when things are dry. And they can pay cash for it eventually. You know, by the time they're 40, you know, they're, they're, they can own a couple million dollars. That's why I say I'm not very impressed with somebody that owns millions of dollars in real estate if they make, you know, a million a year, <laughs> you know. Right. But, and, and see, I'm somebody dropped out of high school. So what I'm showing you is making the money on the real estate. That's mm -hmm. the source. So of let's, my let's, let's talk about that. Like what you said, something there was very profound. The idea that, um, if someone's busy, if someone's busy, they're making money, maybe they're making a few hundred thousand dollars a year, but they're busy. They're in a job. They're an engineer, something like that. You're saying, don't just go and buy and hold and get 8% cash flow or 4% cash flow on their property. Go still go find deals. But the guy is busy. They're working from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. or 5 p.m. or 8 p.m. till 7 p.m. every day. What's, what's right. the path there for finance for fast well, as you're describing it, you still have to go find the deals. Yeah, well, it's tough for guys like that, you know. And to be honest, I make a lot of money off guys like that sometimes when I buy property from them because I don't have time to figure out what the damn thing's worth and they sell it mm -hmm. too cheap. So, I mean, that's kind of your target, you know, when it comes to buying. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you're making a lot of money, then, you know, the bottom line is you better just look at it like, you know, very narrowly in as much as going, how much rent does it bring in? What am I paying for? What's the cap rate? You know, because that's the kind of purchase for a guy like that, unless he's got so much money, you know, or he's got somebody, a friend that is trusted, that is honest. But, you know, you can never trust anybody that makes money off of you. You can't trust a real estate agent. You're nuts. You, you can't. And I'm not, nothing against real estate agents, but, you know, they're hungry. They, they make money on a commission. You know, and it doesn't matter whether you're getting a good deal or a bad deal. They make money. And that's the problem for you, trusting an, an agent. And, but if you do what I do, you'll know what value is in your neighborhood better than any agent. And, you know, like I told you before. So in some ways, uh, uh, Tom, what you're saying is what you the, the philosophy you have requires you to become the boots on the ground, the person on the ground who is going to have to go evaluate the market, evaluate the deals, consistently figure out what's a good deal, what's not a good deal, consistently be on top of it. And as a result, you will start finding deals and making deals and closing deals and making the money. For someone who doesn't have that time, you're saying, well, then this is not for you. You'd really have to go down the route of just buy and hold cash flow real estate. Is that, is that, is that where yeah, we're getting at? I, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can't do everything. I right. mean, I can tell you, you know, one of the best things about me making a lot of money in real estate is I've been able to expand into different areas that I'm not an expert on. 
And those are the areas that I've lost my ass and <laughs> lost money on. Okay. Right. But I can recover because I have money. And so really for people that are, you know, a doctor or anything, you know, and I know lawyers, you know, and uh, doctors, lawyers, money. engineers, they, they save, they yeah. just put their, most of them, they just put their money in the bank. They just save it. And really that's fine because the kind of money that they make, my lawyer makes like 500 bucks an hour now, 550 bucks an hour last time I paid him. Mm -hmm. And so in other words, he is the money machine. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So he can actually make more money just working a 40 hour week than most of us can make investing in real estate full time. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Because he is the money machine. So, you know, you go with your strengths. And so, you know, if you make that kind of money, just save it. And then one day when you retire, then you can start parlaying it and take time and change careers and be a fantastic investor. But, or, or just simply look at cap rate and buy buildings that, you know, you pay a million dollars and if it gives you $20,000 a year income, you know, buy it every time you have a million dollars and pretty soon you'll be set. Yeah. So different kinds of investors, different kinds of situations, different kinds of possibilities for them. If you have all the time in the world, or if you have like, what do you say? How much time would someone need if he was doing exactly what you said? If someone landed in Austin tomorrow and said, Tom, show me exactly what you need, what I need to do. I'm going to do it all day long uh, for whatever time period. What what does that person need to do to do this kind of deal that the kind of deals that you find? Well, if you've got flexibility in your job and you have time to look, that's a big mm -hmm. thing. So right. let's just go through some of the things I've done here. Okay. I was walking my, pushing my daughter in a, in her, uh, you know, whatever. cart. Cart. Yeah. And I see the sidewalk ends and I'm going, Hey, and I see it picks up about a hundred feet ahead of me. I realized there's a lot here. I didn't even know it was a lot that was available. There's a lot here. And it wasn't obvious because of the, just the way the debris and the different terrain. And so I looked it up. Sure enough, there's a lot there. I called the owner, said, hey, I, you want to sell this? And he said, yeah. I said, what can I buy it for? And I figured it was worth 100 grand. He says, I'll take 40, 45,000 for it. I go, how about 40? He says, okay. I bought it for 40. I sold it for 105,000. Did you I'm buy cash buddy. at the time? No, I think I got him to carry a note for 20 grand at the time. Nice. Uh, but, and then I sold it for cash. And so I made a hundred grand right there. Now let's just go a little further up the street. Well, I'm, and this is another story I thought, that's pretty cool. I'm driving along and I see this old guy coming out of a, a progressive insurance building. And I'm going, hey, that old guy looks like he's ready to retire. That's what I always think when I see gray hair. And I go, huh. And so... I look up and I call the progressive insurance office and sure enough, the old guy that just walked in, picked up the phone. I said, Hey, uh, I was wondering if you might be interested in selling that office of yours there. And he said, no, I'm not interested. <coughs> and I said, well, Hey, if you're ever interested, please call me. Here's my number. Okay. I said, sure. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from a guy that rents from me. He, another insurance guy. And he says, uh, Hey, Tom, he goes, I wondered if you'd let me out of my lease. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I've been with me a long time, but yeah, I'll let you out. You know, I mean, I work with people. I don't hold anybody hostage to the, you know, I'm a businessman, but I mean, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I said, no, sure. And he goes, well, I might have an opportunity to buy something and uh, I'd really like to buy it. And I said, well, yeah, sure, no problem. Well, while I'm talking to him about it, he's talking himself out of it. He goes, oh, you know what? Never mind. I'm not going to buy it. Never mind. I go, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Now I'm curious. Uh -huh. go, what are you talking about? He goes, well, this guy that I play golf with, he owns the progressive insurance office up the uh -huh. street. I go, no way. <laughs> I go, I just called him and he told me he wasn't for sale. He said, well, he told me he'd sell it to me and uh, for like 110,000. I go, John, I'm turning my truck around. I'm heading to your right now. <laughs> I go, call him and tell him we'll be in his office in 10 minutes. He goes, oh, well, I, I go, John, I'm going to be there in five minutes. Call uh -huh. him. And so I get there and I say, look, John, that is a good deal. I go, mm. you have to buy that property. It'd be perfect. And I go, if you don't want to buy it, I'll buy it. Or we can buy it together. And I said, we can buy it together. And if you change your mind, I'll give you 10 grand and I'll buy it by myself. 
And he says, well, okay, let's go. We went down there. I, you know, just bought a piece of paper, you know, and I write a lot of offers on napkins at a restaurant and I get them signed on napkins too. But I brought a sheet of paper, sat down and we said, hey, and he introduced me and said, yeah, Tom and I are gonna buy this together and 120,000, okay, 120,000. And uh, I said, okay, so uh, 30 day escrow? He said, yep, yeah. I have cash, I wasn't worried about it. I said, okay. And uh, so he agrees to all of it, we're gonna close it in 30 days, we leave. And, Do you and, give him any deposit for it? No, not at the moment. I don't. I think no. Maybe I did. Maybe I gave him a hundred bucks. I'll give anybody cash. If I, if I don't have a checkbook, I give. I think I think I did give him. I said, "Well, here's a hundred bucks." And he saw. Do people it. actually think of hundred bucks as a deposit at that point, like hundred bucks cash? But these are friends. I mean, it's yeah. a deal. I mean, we're, okay. I'm not giving them a hundred bucks because I'm not serious. You know what I mean? When people want to sell, they want to sell. And you know, this is pretty simple. They know I have the money. You know, I mean, I can pull up an app and go look, mm -hmm. see what I got. I got it covered. But that didn't even happen that day. So on the way back, we drive back and he goes, that's it? He goes, that's all? He, he couldn't believe that I wrote it on a, on a plain piece of paper. I go, yeah, John, that's a deal. We got it done. We'll close it, you know, in a week. Let's just get it closed right away. And he says, oh, okay. He says, were you serious about giving me 10 grand if I let you buy it by yourself? I go, yeah. And he says, all right, well, I'm going to think about that. So the next morning, he calls me early and says, hey, tell him I've been thinking about it. I, I really, I think I'd rather just have the $10,000. I go, okay. I said, I'll bring you a check in about an hour. Mm. And I went over and I gave him a check for 10 grand and he signed off on, you know, giving me his rights. I closed the deal and I sold the property for $280,000. Is that the triangular lot That's that we the one. saw? Yes, that, sir. Uh, that we drove to? Yeah, that now was a beauty. Now it's That's a worth even, yeah. So this clinic or something? Yeah, it wasn't a vet clinic, but yeah. So if this whole sheet of paper was the property, mm -hmm. okay, there was a, this is a major thoroughfare here. Mm -hmm. And this is a corner. There's a 50,000 square foot building here. Mm -hmm. And it has parking in the back. And then this was a little triangle like this. Mm -hmm. yep. And there is a little house, a little house basically. Yep, yep, yep. And that was it. I remember. I yep. remember. Yeah. And what was the beauty of this was that little triangle was sitting in a garden of an area. There was no yard. It was just a house and the parking spots. And then this, this huge company that owned the big building next to it, they're, they were paying for your landscaping. I mean, they were beautiful yard. So yeah, that was the one. So yeah, it's interesting that you remember that, but, yeah. but that's the deal. Who's going to, I mean, not everybody does this. I'm driving. I saw the old man. Mm -hmm. I called. That was my first attempt, right? Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen. And you, most times you strike out. It was just by chance that my own tenant called me mm -hmm. and said, hey, you know, and now he's happy. My tenant was happy. He just wanted 10 grand and he moved on. And, uh, you know, in fact, I went to rent that place. I originally just wanted to rent it. Mm -hmm. And this guy, uh, these sign guys, they make signs. They told me, Tom, you must sell us this property. They wanted it so bad. You must every day you call me, you must sell it. And it was his persistence. Finally, I said, okay, fine. 280. He mm -hmm. said, we'll take it. I'm like, okay. No. <laughs> it's like easy, you know? Yep. So, <coughs> excuse me. But it's uh, all around you if you're looking for it. If you spend the time, if you put the effort in, then you will find the deals. That guy was retiring. I'll tell you another mm -hmm. one. I had an issue with a neighborhood association. So, you know, a neighborhood association, somebody gets upset or plays games. And I'm talking about the, you know, somebody always wants to be the sheriff of the neighborhood, somebody retires and then they got nothing better to do. So, you know, that's a new job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you have conflict with them and then they try to get the neighbors to, you know, agree one way. And then you have to try to convince the neighbors to agree another way. Well, when that happens, you walk the neighborhood. So I walk the neighborhood. Well, I meet each and every neighborhood in about a 40, in about 40 homes in the subdivision. And I ended up mm -hmm. buying eight of those homes because I shook hands and I got to talk to every one of them. And yeah. I don't want to waste an opportunity. I said, hey, if you ever want to sell your property, let me know. And they did. And I bought them. Yeah. And, and I even bought two big industrial buildings that same way. Yeah. Well, Tom, this has been fascinating. Uh, I am, uh, I'm kind of glad that I got to talk to you again about this because this time <laughs> we got some new or some new dimensions into this compared to the 
uh, recording we kind of uh, lost yeah, we last kept, time yeah. around. We kept right? it pretty narrow too, actually. Yeah, this but, time it was uh, it was a little different, but uh, it was really insightful nonetheless, and a different kind of insight, different uh, genre, different taste of insight, and I'm yeah. sure. If I talk to you for 10 hours on this topic, I would still be taking a bunch of notes and figuring out so many different details. So tell our listeners where to find more of you and all that good stuff. Sure, thanks. So look, I have a YouTube channel, Flip Anything USA, that's on YouTube. But really, this book, okay, my book here, this is basically just, it's a course in itself. You can get it on Kindle for 10 bucks. And believe me, I don't care if you buy the book or not. I'm not going to make any money on this book. It's nothing. It's to, nothing to you uh, compared yeah, to what you already have. But, I know that. Yeah. And I mean, but I have four kids and I wanted to leave a, a roadmap for them to follow. And that basically that's what this is. But since I started the station, it's, it's nice. I have young men and women reach out to me and I'm thinking, you know what? I, would, I, I wouldn't have shared any of this stuff a long time ago. I was too, too greedy trying to take as much as I could. Didn't want anybody to screw up my deals. Well, I'm way past that now. I don't care. But, uh, but this is 153 pages. Uh, you can look at the reviews on it. There's fantastic testimonials. And I'm telling you, for 10 bucks on Kindle, I mean, invest the 10 bucks and you're going to, sh- this is worth millions. Okay. Yeah, it's worth yeah. millions. It really and is. and uh, I'll add to it that uh, definitely check out Tom's YouTube channel because he drops a lot of value bombs on real estate uh, on the channel all the time. There's a lot of education going on there. At some point, Tom, I'm going to force you to create a course or a coaching program or a mastermind (laughs) or something so that people can learn from you on real estate investing. This cannot just end at this juncture. So we're going to have to do more than just this. Yeah, that's the problem. The motivation is all I do. I can tell you right now, there's no better way to get it than to get this book because this is a, a condensed concentrated to the point immediately otherwise you got to listen to me blather on in my videos and i it's not bad i enjoy it (laughs) yeah well thanks i appreciate it well manny i I appreciate you having me on and uh, absolutely you guys come on up again yeah Yeah. i'd love to come uh chat with you in austin soon so (laughs) see you later man talk to you later man thank you thank you thank you